Hi. Um, my first question is about uh, the report on the COVID benefits. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk, you could compare a little bit uh, the benefits for individuals versus businesses. Uh, which do you see were more successful um, uh, in their in their delivery and also uh, verification and just mm -hmm. as a whole? Um, so when it came to the benefit programs, we found overall that they were quite effective in meeting the government's objectives of first getting uh, support out to individuals and employers quickly, minimizing um, the increase in uh, poverty or income inequalities, and also helping the economy bounce back from the pandemic. So that would lump in both the individual and um, s support to employers. Uh, when I divide them up throughout the pandemic, what we saw is that the government tried to adjust and add some additional prepayment controls and made modifications to the programs linked to individuals, but really missed those opportunities when it came to the business uh, support. Uh, what we found is that uh, even though the program kept getting extended for the wage subsidy, there was no uh, addition of prepayment controls, which would have minimized the need for rather lengthy and complex post-payment work related to, to businesses. Uh, when it comes to recovery, I think that was the last part of, of your question, um, I would say they're at such early stages in both um, individual and employers that it, it is too early to tell. Uh, that's why we recommended much more rigorous plans. That was the commitment that both of the departments made following my first audits in 2021, that they would put in place comprehensive post-payment plans, and we're just not seeing that happen right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and my follow-up question is about uh, the other report. This is on behalf of my colleague, but um, she's wondering if you could be a little bit more specific about, um, you know, how to prevent wasted doses in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there's been many recommendations following um, H1N1 and SARS and even uh, the first report I released on pandemic preparedness that talked about the need to not only resolve um, data sharing agreements across provinces and territories to have a more timely and informed response, but also to have the technology needed to support that. Vaccine Connect was something that was put in place during um, the response, the rollout of these COVID vaccines, which really they could have had a, a better system in place earlier. If they had implemented all of the functionalities of Vaccine Connect, that could have helped identify supply needs and when vaccines were likely to expire and move them around more effectively, which would have minimized potential, potential wastage. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Bonjour. Uh, vous dites Hello. Que vous êtes inquiète, uh, you said that you are concerned de by an amount of $27 million dollars quand même for benefits. That's a lot of money. Qu'est-ce qui aurait dû être fait dans le suivi euh, pour s'assurer que cet argent-là a été euh, bon, bien dépensé ou du moins qu'on puisse le récupérer? Et est-ce qu'il est trop tard pour récupérer cet argent-là? Vous évoquez 36 mois, euh, ça ne laisse pas grand temps. C'est déjà trop tard pour récupérer ces sommes de potentiel. Alors, on a constaté qu'il y avait des paiements faits en trop de temps dans 4,6 milliards de dollars. Nous avons constaté qu'il y avait des paiements de 4,6 milliards de dollars pour les gens qui n'étaient pas éligibles. Débute et est en train de, de, de se faire par les ministères. Follow-up is being done now by departments, and we believe that there's about 27.4 million dollars that needs to be investigated, where the post-payment verifications need to be done by the government. We identified indicator, in, indicators that certain individuals and businesses were not eligible for the amounts that they received. What concerns me is that the plans are not exhaustive. They don't include all activities, and they don't include a follow-up to see if individuals and businesses are eligible. We need to start there and see if recovery is needed afterwards. Currently, in the legislation, there is a time frame for individuals of 36 months if there isn't any misinformation that was shared. And for businesses, it's about 36 to 48 months. And that's why I was expecting that post-payment activities would start, and we recommended that they should be more exhaustive.
before that deadline. Euh, pour les vaccins, euh, pour ce vaccines, que vous nous offrez là, le 13 millions de doses gaspillées, ça c'est en date du 31 mai. Euh, that selon was vos, vos estimations, May 31st, vos prévisions, est-ce que vous pensez que ce chiffre-là va gonfler de manière importante parce que vous notez qu'il y a beaucoup de doses qui sont en réserve qui vont arriver à péremption là, dans, dans, dans quelques semaines, dans la fin de l'année. Donc, est-ce que ce chiffre-là va augmenter de manière importante so les doses gaspillées? Significantly. Answer. That is a question that I asked the Public Health Agency of Canada. I asked them to tell me what happened with, with the doses following our audit. The department confirmed that there are 11 million doses that have expired. And so the number of doses that have not been used could expire even with the doses. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons recommandé que That's why vaccine Connect we recommended être mis that en place vaccine pour Connect should be implemented in order to better manage uh, vaccines and to minimize waste in the future. Merci. Next up, Brian, National Post. Yeah, hi there. On, on vaccines, I'm wondering overall, you've talked about some of the logistical issues and, and the, the tracking, et cetera, that the government could have done better. But having ordered seven different vaccines and tens of millions of doses in advance, was this level of wastage unavoidable once all these vaccines were delivered and, and, and worked um, as well as the government expected, I guess? I mean, that's a, it's a great question now to sit here and, and look back and think of what happened. And I would invite all of us to try and put ourselves back in March of 2020. Um, and the environment that was going on then when um, the government entered into advanced purchase agreements. Uh, there was a, um, a global rush to develop a vaccine. No one knew which vaccine companies would develop viable vaccines, which would then be approved for use in Canada. Um, and the, and uh, there was a large global demand where Canada doesn't have any manufacturing capabilities for those vaccines. So in my view, the approach that the government took to enter into advanced purchase agreements was a prudent one. Um, they knew that that would result in um, excess vaccines or surplus vaccines being available, which is why there was a commitment to make donations. But there again, so many countries were trying to donate and that market saturated, resulting in the, in the Canadian government not being as successful as they could. Uh, but in my view, it was a prudent approach given all the uncertainty back in 2020. And, and now we're able to look back and, and see the results of, of those decisions. Okay. Just a follow-up for a colleague. In terms of the, the overpayments uh, of the CERB and, uh, CERB and other benefits, uh, do you have an estimation of how much of those uh, overpayments are the result of sort of good faith mistakes by Canadians and how much are fraud? And do you have an estimate of how much you think the government can realistically expect to recover from that process? Unfortunately, I can't give you an answer to either either of those questions because of the limited information that's available at the Canada Revenue Agency right now. When it came to individuals, uh, uh, the, the 2019 and 2020 tax returns are now available. They weren't available earlier on, um, which is why we've identified some payments uh, that require further investigation um, that I feel pretty confident are ineligible. But in order to really give, um, you know, take the more prudent approach of, of giving the benefit of the doubt to the taxpayer, um, we've identified them as needing follow-up. When it comes to the businesses, there was very little information that was collected on a monthly basis. Um, and so without post-payment verification, it would be almost impossible to know um, the ability to recover or not, or even to identify with greater certainty uh, what w went to in ineligible businesses, which is why much more rigorous post-payment work is needed from the government. Thank you. Uh, next up, Bill Curie, Globe and Mail. Hi, thanks for taking our questions. To follow up on the $27 billion, uh, one of your recommendations is the government should more aggressively pursue that, at, and you've described it as a minimum amount, that it could be more than that. The government's response is that they only partially agree to that recommendation, and they make the argument that it uh, is likely not cost efficient to go after all of that money. So what is your reaction to their response to that? 
Uh, well, I obviously stand by my recommendations, and, and I base my recommendations on two things. Following our 2021 uh, audit on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, the department's committed to rigorous post-payment work. And so I was expecting to see that happening now, and, and it, it is just not happening to the degree that I believe it should be, given the very limited prepayment controls that were, available, that were used um, at the start of these programs. Um, the second is I would point to existing legislation that requires that every Canadian taxpayer be treated fairly and that if the, uh, an individual or a business receives something they're not entitled to, it should be returned. Uh, so our expectation is that anyone who has a high indicator of potentially being el ineligible should be investigated further. The decision then about recovery is one that I encourage the government to, to, to be transparent about what they decide to do. If they want to, for, perhaps, um, forgive payments or take a compassionate approach, then they should just be clear and transparent with all Canadians what to expect. Um, I think from memory it's pretty unusual for a government to not fully accept a recommendation. I, I could be wrong on that, but um, in the back and forth, had they at any point rejected outright that recommendation? Can you t kind of talk about the back and forth that went into that? Um, no, I, so I think many, most departments like to agree to our recommendations. I'm not sure that their written answer then supports that agreement, but um, that's, that's another issue for us to deal with. Um, here, the back and forth that we had was very clear. They felt that they didn't have the resources or the, or, or the uh, ability to follow up with everyone identified as ineligible. Um, but again, I base it on fairness to all um, taxpayers. I I'm sure there are individuals out there who are wondering, will I be asked to repay? Will I be able to repay? And that's where I encourage that their plans should just be made clear to Canadians so that um, every, every individual in business knows what to expect. On va passer à Raphaël Pirot, Agence QMI. Raphaël Pirot, Agence QMI. Oui, bonjour. Um, écoutez, yes, hello. Je veux savoir si un montant I would like to know if there's a minimum amount perdu, that we're maintenant. certain to have lost. Donc, l'argent qui est versé en trop so et qu'on sait que qu'on ne pourra jamais aller chercher. That we'll never be able to recover. Encore, c'est une question que je ne pourrais answer. pas répondre. Je this ne connais pas is a question um, that I won't be able to answer. I don't know of si an uh, individual's or a company's capacity to refund funds. There were $4.6 billion that were sent to recipients that were ineligible for the $27 billion. That's a minimum amount because there are other eligibility criteria that we were not able to verify. And that's why the government can identify, can only identify the sums if they do a vigorous post-payment assessment. Deuxième question, en fait, il y a une Second grande question. différence entre le 5 There's milliards et le 27 billion billion. How can that be explained? Um, alors, le, le 4,6 milliards de For the 4 dollars, billion dollars, qui ont été fournis, those are payments to individuals at the beginning of the pandemic alors, de that were paid, that were duplicated, rather. Une prestation durant une période. People were supposed to receive uh, one benefit at a time, uh, and there was a little bit of confusion at the beginning. A, Individuals uh, were sending a, an application to ESDC and to the CRA, and they received two payments. And those are cases that absolutely need a follow-up. For the rest, it's estimates or information that is missing at the CRA. So that's... That's what's left from all the other programs. Global. Um, you've said that the programs, or the, the, the money programs, were effective in meeting the government's objectives. But considering the amount of money that's kind of unaccounted for here in terms of whether or not it was appropriately paid out, do you think the programs themselves were effective? Mm -hmm. Um, so we concluded they were effective in meeting the objectives, which, which I would summarize high level as getting funds out quickly to individuals and businesses, minimizing an increase in poverty um, or income inequalities across the country, and also allowing businesses to maintain that relationship with their employees and rebound once the economy reopened. That was effective. There's lots of statistics in our report from Statistics Canada that demonstrate them. I would argue that they were inefficient in that the, the decision early on to limit pre-payment uh, um, controls 
knowing that there would be um, payments made to ineligible individuals has now resulted in, in billions of dollars going to ineligible individuals or, pot or potentially going to ineligible individuals. And that's why the, the hard work is now needed uh, when you minimize prepayment to do rigorous post-payment work to identify who is really ineligible and then make decisions about recovery. Just in English, similar to my colleague's question, it is a big gap between 4.7 and 27. Why is there such a wide gap there from your perspective? So the $4.6 billion that we identified that was to ineligible individuals really relates to the start of the pandemic where um, mostly I would assume because of confusion, individuals applied to both the Canada Revenue Agency and Employment and Social Development uh, Canada to receive a, 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 the same benefit for one period. So all of the individual income support programs and individuals only allowed to receive one benefit per period. So that doubling up is, is the $4.6 billion for the most part. Part. Um, the rest were now we're talking about all the other COVID uh, programs as they continue to go on versus just the first few months of, of the pandemic. So that explains the, the, the large difference in the two buckets of, of funds that we identified. Dernière question dans la salle, Antoine Trépani, Last question in the room, Antoine um, Trépani, Vous parlez d'un manque de rigueur dans le recouvrement. Est-ce que vous avez été en mesure d'identifier la cause de ce manque de rigueur? Est-ce qu'on parle de directives politiques, de structures, de gouvernance ou de systèmes qui sont en place? Est-ce que c'est la main d'œuvre qui, qui a mal fait son travail? Est-ce que c'est les fonctionnaires qui ont mal fait leur travail? Public servants um, who did not do their jobs correctly. Rigueur, Have you been able to identify uh, that lack of rigor? Answer. Firstly, the plans are not exhaustive. They don't contain all of the activities and don't include activities to see if all payments having a risk indicator are going to receive a follow-up. That's where there's a lack of rigor. We asked that question of the CRA and they confirmed that delays were caused by the pandemic and that's why we recommended that that they do more work soon because of the time that they have to identify if payments were made to ineligible recipients. Those two departments that you mentioned in the report, that's where there was a lot of change in staff, a lot of new hires. Dans, Could that have played a role là, in résultats. the dynamic and in the results? Uh, regardé, no. um, Answer, we didn't look at the individuals or resources at the departments. I believe that having an exhaustive plan would have helped them determine their needs for resources and time. That's why we need a comprehensive plan but we did not look at public servants and capacity specifically. Thank you. We're now going to move to questions on Zoom. Questions on Zoom. Uh, we have quite some time, so um, that's good. We're on course to answer them all. Um, first up, Emily Bergeron de La Presse Canadienne. <laughs> Oui, bonjour. Euh, pour continuer dans la même veine que to mon continue collègue Antoine Trépanier, euh, sur le manque de rigueur, um, qu'est-ce qui Antoine aurait Trépanier été une approche of euh, What euh, en amont euh, could have qui been aurait eu plus de rigueur là, selon, euh, selon les tendances de votre analyse? Qu'est-ce qui aurait été une façon de faire qui, euh, dès le départ, là, aurait eu plus de rigueur? Would have Increase the rigor. Again, I believe that the decision made at the beginning of the pandemic to follow some of the international best practices was a good decision, but that comes with a need to have a lot of post-payment verifications. I would have liked to see uh, que la that the government, Il y a eu de, I would have liked for them to have made uh, adjustments uh, exemple, during the pandemic. For example, when the wage subsidy was extended multiple times or following our audit in 2021, they could have implemented more rigor before payments. Because without that vigor, there needs a post-payment plan that is more exhaustive. Lié, um, au, uh, 
euh, déclarations de, 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 de TPS et They toutes les autres informations que l'Agence de revenus avait dans leur possession pour GST identifier les paiements um, à risque d'être éligibles. En ce moment, leurs sont très minimes. Um, presque semblable au taux de, de vérification qu'ils font dans un programme habituel où ce qui a beaucoup They de have similar verifications et je m'attendais in other programs and so I was expecting to see more vigor this time. Et en suivi sur l'autre question, dit celui sur les doses de vaccins qui ont été perdues. Um, vous avez parlé doses. de problèmes liés au système d'échange de données to uh, entre le fédéral et les data provinces. Sharing system between the federal uh, vous dites que c'est un problème qui n'est pas nouveau, you que ça fait depuis 1999 que c'est un problème et que c'est urgent de remédier. Alors, est-ce que ça bloque vraiment du côté de l'Agence de la santé publique du Canada pour vous établir le système de partage de données. Safety. Ici, ça bloque de ce côté-là, du côté du fédéral. Où exactement dans le processus ça bloque? Where is the problem Alors, je ne pourrais pas vous dire si c'est vraiment le gouvernement fédéral ou toutes les autres I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's the federal government um, or savez, other levels of government. La santé est vraiment euh, une responsabilité partagée. Health is a shared responsibility de, de, de between the different levels of government. The lack of a pan-Canadian agreement to share data is something that we have raised for over 25 years as an issue. D'urgence sanitaire qu'il faut qu'on passe à travers comme how many other health crises do we need as a country before we find a solution to that data, share, data sharing? Um, tout notre système de santé ici au Canada, au moins ici, et au niveau des Canadiens. Et alors, c'est pour ça que j'ai fait une recommandation pour le gouvernement d'aller de l'avant pour conclure l'entente pan-canadienne de partage d'informations. Merci. Euh, question suivante, Mylène Crête, de la presse. Following question, Mylène Crête. Bonjour. Justement, concernant Hello. le partage de données avec les provinces, je me demandais si vous savez comment ça se passait avec le Québec. I was wondering if you had any information um, on non, pas du data tout. sharing je with ne Quebec. Pas vérifier Answer. Ce qui se passe avec toutes les I cannot Vraiment, je, see je what du côté happens du with fédéral. the provinces. Um, et, uh, I only looked at the federal government, and they don't have an agreement, and that is why I made a recommendation to the government to work on that. Donc, vous constatez qu'il n'y a pas mais so, on, on there is no agreement. Ça fonctionne dans les négociations avec les provinces. We don't have information on how it's going uh, concernant l'agence de My second du question Canada, has to do uh, with the CRA. Là, they announced last week that they wanted to recover 3.2 billion dollars uh, of overpayment. Uh, overpayment. de l'année 2023, il est trop tard vu le is délai de 36 mois pour récupérer ces à mon avis, il reste encore du temps pour identifier les paiements qui sont faits à des individus ou des entreprises qui sont éligibles ou ineligibles à des individus ou des entreprises. Une fois qu'ils ont identifié les entreprises, il reste plus de temps parce que tous les paiements n'ont pas été mis au début de 2020. Parce que pas tous les paiements ont été mis au début de 2020. Donc, je les encourage à commencer Juste, est-ce que vous savez combien de temps il resterait? Do you know how much time um, they have left? Je, pas avec certitude. Pour Answer, dire que les not with any certainty, but I think that the first payments were sent out in April 2020, so 36 months is Next up, is coming in shortly. CBC. Can you hear us, Hello. JP? Can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. You can? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so um, you said in your conclusion that you're, uh, you're expecting significant unrecoverable amounts are likely to materialize with respect to the, the benefits that were paid out. Why have you come to this conclusion? Why aren't you confident that the government will, will claw back all the money that was paid out to ineligible people? Um, so I, I, I think I ended my closing remarks with there's a possibility that that be the case. Um, 
the uh, the government needs to first, according to the current legislation, identify and notify individuals, and there is a legislative limit to that time frame uh, in order to be able to notify individuals and businesses if they have received amounts that are ineligible. Um, my, my advice to them is if they wanted to make uh, a decision then about recovery, one that might either forgive payments or be empathetic, then that's something they should be clear and transparent to with Canadians. Uh, but current legislation would require them to follow up with those individuals and recover those amounts. And you mentioned in the report that there's actually relatively few cases have been referred to the authorities, to the police for fraud or identity theft. Do you think, you know, is it fair to say that there was likely a lot more criminality around these programs that has just gone undetected? Um, unfortunately, I could not um, confirm that. Uh, again, a lot of information not being collected at the beginning of the program um, it leads to the need for post-payment work to confirm uh, eligibility factors. When we did see instances where there was um, potential fraud, we ensured that the agency had either taken proper action and, or referred them to the authorities and didn't do any further work in order not to get in uh, the way of that investigation. We will go to Alex Bellingal, Toronto Star. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to circle back on something you mentioned uh, in French. I think it was to Louise's question earlier um, about vaccine wastage since the end of May, uh, I guess from the inventory of 32 and a half million that, that was sitting in various government inventories. Uh, was I correct in hearing that you said another 11 million have since expired? And, and if so, do you have an idea of what, what the size of that inventory is now as we're a few weeks away from the end of the year? Um, so this is where I should have put my glasses on when I answered the first question, <laughs> um, to, to, to be accurate with you. Um, those were donated. I think the question there was about donations originally, so an extra 11 million had been donated after year end, so my apologies if I did misspeak. Um, expired um, afterwards, um, after, well not after year end, after the end of our audit, which was May. Um, there was an additional, um, I would say, about um, 10, 10 million or so doses that have expired since. Um, and this is exactly why we recommended that um, Vaccine Connects needs to be put into place and its full functionalities be used. Um, we even pointed to some of the data really not being um, very solid data and having errors in it. Um, as the country continues to buy doses, whether they be bivalent doses uh, or, or others, it, it makes sense to have uh, a better handle on where the inventory is and better management controls to avoid um, minimizing um, you know, wastage in the future. But there is some doses, both included in inventory and those available for donation, that have since expired since the end of May. Okay, thanks. It was probably my French, I mean, maybe not your mistake, although uh, <laughs> the transcript will tell, I guess. Um, so, but uh, an additional 10 million basically expired. So we're talking about, you know, 24, 23.6 million doses expired. I, I guess in terms of the donations, um, I know the report kind of touches on this. I'm wondering if you can expand on this. Um, what did you learn about the difficulties the government has had in, in actually, you know, with these surplus doses that are sitting there, donating them to other countries that, that need them? Um, well, the, government, the Canadian government, like many governments, made a commitment to donate certain um, doses to, to, to foreign countries. Um, there were some logistical complications in trying to do that. The age, um, the shelf life remaining on some of the vaccines at times uh, caused some difficulties, but really the biggest was the saturation of the donation market. So many other countries were donating um, that Canada just couldn't ship all the ones they intended to ship. Thank you. Uh, next up, Chris Nardi, National Post. Good, uh, good morning. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as you know, CRA has been doing audits and verifications for the better part of many decades now and uh, arguably has a lot of experience in that. Um, so I'm wondering if you were surprised when you were going through uh, their process and their post-verification um, protocols, surprised by how disappointed ultimately I read that you are in how 
you know, lackluster or, or not very thorough that they are. Was that surprising to you, considering the agency's experience? Well, I think that the pandemic is really an unusual time, and the responses uh, require an unusual level of work. Um, so uh, what we found was that Canada Revenue Agency was was taking its typical approach of risk-based and, and sampling, and in, in our view, that is just not rigorous enough when you have such limited prepayment controls. Um, and, and I think this is why um, two of our recommendations are really key in the audit about um, the government advancing its plans and projects to have uh, real-time revenue and real-time payroll information systems available going forward. Not only would this just improve um, the integrity of Canada's tax system and have better information on hand, it would improve the efficiency and effectiveness of any future income programs that might be needed should the country have to go through a similar um, health emergency in the future. And, and just to circle back as well to, to Bill Curry's questions on the kind of semi-agreed upon a recommendation, um, CRA says basically it wouldn't be particularly efficient to try to go and recoup every single dollar that was overpaid. Um, whereas you say, well, you should at least make you know a strong effort to get as much as you can. Do you get the sense that the agency is just trying to kind of set the bar relatively low so that it can't disappoint as opposed to actually make the maximal effort and get the maximal recovering? Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you really what the agency is thinking when they decided to to partially agree with my recommendation. I'd encourage you to to ask them. Um, you know, my job is to hold them responsible for delivering programs within the current legislation um, and within what I believe are the best practices. When you have limited prepayment controls, you have rigorous, comprehensive postpayment work that is needed to verify eligibility. Last question that I see on Zoom. Uh, so if uh, you are listening on Zoom and want to ask a question, it's time to use the raise hand function at this moment. So last question is Palak Mangat from uh, Politics Today. Hi, Ms. Hogan. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, in, in sort of the early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk around the cost of individual vaccines, and the government often said that, you know, it couldn't specifically say because of commercially sensitive info. Um, and that it could hinder their ongoing or future negotiations with other manufacturers. Can you speak to whether or not that's something you came across too? Um, I know that the average cost for vaccines in your report is listed at about $30, $30 but that's as of May this year. So, uh, so I'm just wondering whether or not there were other estimates that you had, or do you think those numbers maybe fluctuated dramatically? Uh, so throughout our audit, we actually had access to all of the advanced purchase agreements and amendments to them, but we too have to respect the confidentiality clauses that were included in those contracts and can't provide a lot of details about um, the vaccines and the vaccine costs. But I knew that Canadians and parliamentarians would want to, to have an idea of the estimate of the cost of a vaccine. And so what we did was use information that was publicly available, so all of the payments to vaccine companies through the Public Accounts of Canada, and then the 169 million doses that we saw the, the, the government had paid for during our audit period. Uh, so I can tell you um, that I'm confident it approximates the average cost of all the doses uh, that the government has paid for, but I would caution that that's at a point in time. As more doses are received, that number can fluctuate up and down. Foreign exchange will play a factor. So it really is just um, to give sort of a, a, a benchmark to individuals on the cost, average cost of a vaccine um, a, as of May of 2022. Thank you. Okay, and just, Excuse me, go, go ahead for your um, other question. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, just as a follow up, um, and I don't want to be sort of alarmist here, just, I guess, moving forward for future emergencies or in case of the future pandemics, does, does the nature of these negotiations or maybe the lack of some information make it difficult for, for you or governments to kind of hammer out which companies are, you know, the best or maybe most cost effective ones? Um, yeah. 
Well, I don't think it's unusual um, to have such confidentiality clauses in the pharmaceutical industry, um, but you know these were really unusual times. And what was going on in 2020 is something that really had never been seen: the global demand, the global race to find uh, a vaccine, and so all of those played into um, you know the factors that of that ended up being terms and conditions of these contracts. Um, but I was not hindered. Um, my office had full access to all the information. Merci. Um, il y a plus tout, tout le monde l'occasion de poser une question. Everyone had the opportunity to ask a question. Left, if it's okay with you, Madame si. Vérificatrice Générale. Si vous qui contrôlez la, oui, uh, just a question from myself. Um, concernant les uh, Boris Proulx du devoir, concernant uh, le devoir, vos calculs du 27 uh, milliards de dollars, c'est uh, suspecté d'être inadmissible. C'est pas clair du tout, uh, parce que dans vos calculs, en page 23, je crois, de votre rapport, vous report, détaillez pourquoi les montants sont inadmissibles. Donc, uh, est-ce que, selon vous, on peut carrément Do parler de... 8,3 milliards de dollars versés à 627 000 bénéficiaires inadmissibles, 3,8 milliards versés à 1,4 million de bénéficiaires inadmissibles, 15,5 milliards à des entreprises inadmissibles. Pourquoi vous faites cette distinction-là? Pouvez-vous m'expliquer un distinction? peu? Can you explain it, um, parce qu'on a détaillé le, le calcul un peu pour démontrer que um, c'est un peu complexe, c'est qu'il manque d'informations à l'Agence de revenus du Canada pour qu'on puisse comprendre Uh, avec, um, certainty, for us to conclude with certainty that these um, amounts are ineligible. Parce que, uh, for individu individuals, si dans les they mois would be eligible if in the 12 uh, months before the application that they had received $5,000 in income. De, de sont sur, uh, le calendrier But Tax alors, returns are on a calendar year, and so mois, the information mois, salary per month is not available. And that is why we recommended that having a system with real-time information would, very, would be very useful for the future. For businesses now, as I mentioned, there was no information collected by the CRA on monthly revenues. And this information does not exist at the CRA except for sales taxes. And again, that's only businesses that share that on a monthly basis. So there's a lack of information, and that's why we say that these are high-risk indicators and the government needs a more in-depth follow-up. In the government's response, they say that the high-risk indicators were verified, but what you're, what you're saying is that there are other uh, high-risk indicators that were set aside, Absolutely. the GST, for example. Answer, yes, because we looked at um, all of the de, de businesses that send in their provincial tax sales on a monthly basis. We believe that the government sample is too small, and that is why we recommend a more exhaustive approach for post payments. For a few uh, extra questions, I saw a little, little fingers. Uh, I'll start with uh, Bill, perhaps, from uh, uh, Global Mail. I just want to follow up. You made a comment saying if the government wanted to waive payment obligations for reasons of empathy, they should say so. Um, if the government went down that road, because presumably when you look at your report, a lot of the people who receive these benefits are some of the lowest income people in Canada. Some are ineligible because they didn't even have 5,000 in income, the threshold, according to your report. So if they were to make that argument, what would your take be on that? Um, I, I, I'm not the one who sets law or, or makes those kind of policy decisions, but I absolutely think it would be a reasonable approach. But I encourage them to be clear with Canadians. Right? I think one of the greatest things about our country is you can expect um, fairness and, and transparency. And I'm just asking the government to be clear with its decisions and its approaches to Canadians. Uh, right now, the legislation would require them to follow up with every uh, individual and business that is ineligible. Follow up on the wage subsidy. The report breaks 
down by size of company. And there's a pretty sizable percentage as five employees or less. Uh, are you trying to signal anything by breaking that down? Uh, should were you more concerned about particularly small companies, or is there is, is any section more high risk? I guess of no, not at all. I think what we were trying to demonstrate, there's a lot of demographics in the back end of our audit report, was to show that um, individuals and businesses that needed support the most received it. Um, now it's about identifying if there are those um, that were ineligible for the, for, for the benefits and, and making a decision about recovery. Um, so it was really just to help everyone understand uh, where the funding went, um, whether it was um, across provinces or across sizes of businesses. Louis, en français, and then Ryan. Bonjour, um, Louis Blouin de Radio-Canada. Quand vous voyez ça, là, des, des dizaines de milliards de dollars dépensés, peu de suivi ensuite pour des remboursements, question très simple, est-ce que c'est de la saine gestion de finances publiques, ça, pour vous? Est-ce que c'est digne d'un pays du G7? Um, c'est une question qui est intéressante, mais c'est dans un temps régulier, je vous dirais que non. Uh, mais c'est vraiment un temps qui n'est pas régulier. Um, L'approche qui a été prise au début de la, la pandémie était une approche jamais prise avant où il y avait très peu de contrôle préalable au paiement, que le gouvernement se fiait sur les représentations des contribuables, que ce soit des individus ou des entreprises. Um, et maintenant, il faut avoir une approche hors ordinaire aussi sur le suivi. Euh, pour démontrer exactement ça, une bonne gestion euh, des, des, des fonds publics. Euh, mais encore, euh, si le gouvernement veut prendre une approche qui est différente, une approche euh, qui, qui renonce à, à recouvrir des paiements, euh, c'est leur choix, mais je leur encourage d'être très clair avec les Canadiens. I'm just wondering as well, you know, the government has made additional vaccine purchases probably since your audit, the bivalent boosters and things like that. Were you able to look at those contracts on a go forward basis to know if um, the government is putting better controls in place so there won't, we, won't, won't be more wastage going forward? Because mm -hmm. we know there hasn't been a big take up, for example, in bivalent boosters uh, compared to Canada's population. Um, so unfortunately, I can't talk about the terms of the contracts that um, that we did look at. Um, they're all within the, the seven uh, that that we we examined. Um, I think the way to control wastage and to better monitor take up would be to really implement all the functionalities of Vaccine Connect. Um, uh, you know, the goal was to ensure that every Canadian who wanted to be vaccinated could have access to vaccines, and, and that was achieved. Now it's about minimizing wastage and better inventory management going forward. And, and you may not be able to answer this one, but you talked about you've seen the, the terms and conditions. Most Canadians have not seen the terms and conditions. Are you satisfied that we paid reasonable prices uh, for the vaccines? Were we paying prices that were equal or equivalent to what other Western countries paid? So it's a difficult question again to answer. If you go back to what the market looked like back in 2020 when the negotiations had to take place, as I mentioned earlier, no one knew uh, which vaccine companies would be successful. Um, no one knew which vaccines would be ultimately approved for use in Canada. Um, Canada did not have manufacturing capabilities for these vaccines, so all of those factors played into um, the, the prices that were negotiated. When it comes to comparing to other countries, again, very difficult. Most of those countries, um, one, have not made those prices um, publicly available, but um, likely had manufacturing capabilities, um, and, and so you would expect that they would pay a different amount than a country that did not um, have access to vaccines so readily. Chris from National Post on the line from a very last question, and then uh, JP Tasker from CBC, and that will be it. Uh, Ms. Hogan, I just wanted to circle back to the tables towards the end of your report. So you talked about, obviously, the 27-odd billion dollars that you said CRA did to investigate even more. But then in the tables at the end, you seem to have supplemental amounts on top of that that you say should also be investigated but are even excluded from what i understand from the 27 billion dollars and that includes like 1.2 million dollars in serb payments to dead people um or the 6.1 million to people who were incarcerated when they received it what's the distinction there why aren't those amounts in the should be investigated 
are like not suspicious enough? What is it exactly? Um, well, that's exactly why the statement that I made was that we've identified at least $27.4 billion in payments to individuals and businesses that require further investigation. There are ele other elements, as you say, in the in the back where we talk about each individual program. Um, there we were just missing too much information to either um, have an audit level confidence that we should put them in the $27.4 billion, um, or we couldn't really quantify them. Um, in, in, in a good way. So again, it's about missing information and that's why post-payment verification is really the only way to confirm um, the actual amounts uh, paid to ineligible individuals um, and, and that's why we recommended much more rigorous work is needed. JP from CBC. Yeah, I had a very similar question to Chris there. I want you to kind of talk about that $27.4 billion figure. It's, it seems like it's a minimum, right? And then there are other sections that you just couldn't. Uh, there's other potential cases of overpayments that you didn't include in that figure. Can you just kind of speak to why those weren't included and uh, maybe how much they could be worth? Again, it was it was really um, the uncertainty around some of the amounts and um, the uh, on the missing information. So, for example, an individual um, who um, died during the year would have been eligible for payments up until um, their date of death. Um, and so there is some information that we didn't have uh, during our audit in order to make good conclusions, right? Uh, so that's why we, we, we triage them into different buckets. Those that we have a lot more confidence are are included in the $27.4 billion. And then there is further follow-up needed for other amounts, um, both on the individual and business front. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tous. Ceci met fin à Thank la conférence de presse. Thanks to all for conference. a great discipline. We've been through a great amount of questions, so that, that is how it should be. Merci à Madame la vérificatrice générale. Et sur ce, bonne Thank journée. Thank you to the Auditor General. Bonne journée. Thank you. Have a good day.